Good afternoon to everyone attending today's presentation. My name is Mark Womack. I'll be your moderator and I work with Parkinson Society Southwestern Ontario as your community development coordinator in Gray and Bruce counties. Uh, welcome to today's presentation. Thank you for joining us. We have a great group of people today, a uh, large crowd and some really enthusiastic, enthusiastic presenters. Uh, really happy to have them join us and talk about sleeping well with Parkinson's, how to improve your sleep hygiene. So joining us today as our panelists, we have Sydney Hampton. And Sydney is a first year occupational therapy student with Western University in London. She's completing her eight week placement at PSSO and has enjoyed joining in the various support groups and hearing personal experiences from people living with Parkinson's. As sleep is a common concern she's heard in the support groups, she and the other, other OT students decided to use their occupational therapy lens to share some tricks and tips and help to help improve sleep. Sydney's favorite sleep hygiene tip is using meditation before bed. Meditation is a great way to calm your thoughts and help you drop off into a relaxing sleep. Kelly Tebbett is currently a first year occupational therapy student also at Western. She's completing her eight week, week placement again with us here at PSSO and has enjoyed hearing about people's lived experiences with Parkinson's and also learning about how the disease for, uh, about how the disease further and how occupational therapy can help individuals with Parkinson's. She recognized sleep was a common concern for people with Parkinson's and it was an area that occupational therapists could help address. This is what led her along with the other OT students to put together this presentation on how to sleep well with Parkinson's by improving your, your sleep hygiene. Kaylee uses a lot of these sleep hygiene tips in her own life and finds them very helpful to get a good night's sleep. Our final presenter is Jonathan Chan. And Jonathan is also a first year occupational therapy student at Western. He completed his Bachelor of Science at the University of Toronto with a double major in nutrition and health and disease. While working with the clients at PSSO and being in various support groups, he's noticed many people are experiencing challenges with sleep and hopes the webinar will give clients an easy way to implement strategies to help people sleep better. So without further ado, well, please welcome our presenters, and I'm going to change the format and allow Kayla, or allow Sydney to take over. So just bear with us, technical issues. And Sydney, Jonathan, and Kaylee, if you can unmute your mics, you have the floor. Perfect, thanks, Mark. Um, so welcome everybody. I'm gonna pass it along to Kaylee to start off our presentation. Sorry about that, everyone. My microphone would let me unmute there. So today's webinar is going to cover how you can sleep well with Parkinson's by improving your sleep hygiene. So the learning objectives for today's webinar are to review and understand common sleep disorders and issues associated with Parkinson's disease and learn about how COVID has affected sleep. We will then learn about occupational therapy and how it can help individuals with Parkinson's, specifically in relation to sleep concerns. We will then gain an understanding of what is meant by sleep hygiene, as well as learn about different strategies, interventions, and adaptations for improved sleep hygiene. We will then finish off the presentation, learning about the benefits of improved sleep and sleep hygiene for overall wellness, and learning about other professionals and available resources in the community. So we did want to acknowledge a few disclaimers before getting into the presentation. So we are not experts on sleep, but we've used our knowledge gained from our educational program in occupational therapy, in addition to extensive research to put together the most up-to-date, accurate, and helpful information. We also want to acknowledge 
that everyone is different and has unique circumstances. So use these strategies and suggestions as you see fit and see if they work for you. We also want to make note that there are other interventions, including pharmaceutical based strategies that go beyond the occupational therapy scope that can also be effective. We encourage you to consider all of your options and speak with other healthcare professionals if these tips do not work for you. Okay, so to begin, we will discuss some sleep problems and disorders that impact people's overall quality of sleep. These sleep problems and disorders are relatively common for people with Parkinson's disease. By gaining an understanding about these various sleep problems will help in developing an intervention plan to support your current needs for improving sleep hygiene. To start, restless leg syndrome is a common sensory motor disorder that is characterized by an individual's urgency to move their legs due to an uncomfortable and unpleasant sensation. By moving their legs, it provides um, by, removing their, by moving their legs, it provides a temporary feeling of relief. However, it makes it difficult for people to fall asleep. Insomnia is commonly characterized as having difficulties falling asleep and also staying asleep. For individuals with Parkinson's, waking frequently throughout the night is a common occurrence that results in a broken and poor night's sleep. Next, we will talk about sleep problems and disorders that are involved with the stages of sleep. First, NREM parasomnia, or non-rapid eye movement parasomnia, describes the act of sleepwalking, sleep terrors, and confusional arousal. This occurs during the third stage of the sleep cycle when you are considered to be in a deep sleep and your heart rate and muscles are extremely relaxed. It is difficult to wake up during this period of sleep from noises in your external environment. However, if you do wake up during this time, you often experience those feelings of confusion and grogginess. REM parasomnia, on the other hand, occurs during the REM stage or the final stage of the sleep cycle. In this stage, your heart rate and breathing occur at a faster rate and your brain is much more active. This is when you experience those vivid and intense dreams. People with REM parasomnia often experience nightmares and vivid dreams that sometimes causes them to wake abruptly. However, during this stage, your brain allows your arms and legs to be in a paralyzed state to prevent you from acting out these dreams. For people with Parkinson's disease, individuals may experience REM sleep behavior disorder. It is a type of REM parasomnia associated with a dopamine deficiency. Due to unknown causes, people living with Parkinson's do not experience this paralyzed state during the REM stage and in doing so, act out the content of their dreams. Depending on the nature of the dream, motor actions may be dangerous and violent and may lead to injuries, especially for care partners sharing the same bed. Sydney, I'm going to interrupt you for just a moment. I'm not sure if I'm having technical difficulties. Um, I'm still seeing your screen with the notes on it. Is that? I thought it looked weird. Hold on, let me see if I can change it. <laughs> Sorry, I just want to make sure everybody at home is getting the full effect. There we go. Perfect. Oh, amazing. Sorry about that, everybody. Thank you. Sorry to interrupt. Please continue. Okay, so another sleep concern individuals with Parkinson's may experience is excessive daytime sleepiness, also known as hypersomnia. So this is the feeling of being sleepy or sleeping too much during the day. So the severity of this can range anywhere from mild to intense sleepiness. This can be a symptom of Parkinson's disease that may even start before you experience motor symptoms associated with Parkinson's or can be caused by the side effects of Parkinson's medications. This can make it difficult to get sleep during the night if you are sleeping a lot during the day as well as making it difficult to complete your daily activities if you experience feelings of sleepiness. If you are experiencing intense sleepiness during the day, you may experience what is known as sleep attacks. These are defined as the sudden desire to sleep that may lead to individuals falling asleep without warning. This can occur in a variety of situations, which can be dangerous if this occurs, for example, when you are driving. Another sleep condition that individuals with Parkinson's may experience is sleep apnea. 
This is a sleep disorder in which the person's breathing momentarily stops during sleep. This can cause you to wake up frequently during the night, which can contribute to overall sleepiness and fatigue during the day, as well as being associated with excessive snoring. The last sleep condition we are going to be talking about is excessive nighttime urination, also known as nocturia. This is characterized by the urge to urinate many times during the night. This can interrupt sleep and make it harder to get back to sleep, which can impact your overall sleep quality. With all the changes we've experienced over the last year and a half, there is the question of the impact that COVID-19 has had on our quality of sleep. We were able to find a recent study that reviewed quality of sleep and symptom management for people living with Parkinson's during COVID. In this study, it was found that almost 24% of participants with Parkinson's reported new onset or worsening of sleep concerns throughout the pandemic. It was reported that over 50% of individuals had an increase in symptoms of insomnia, over 24% in restless leg syndrome, and over 22% in symptoms of REM sleep disorders. In relation to the new or worsening sleep concerns mentioned, individuals have also reported experiencing worse motor and non-motor symptoms of Parkinson's that have overall impacted their quality of life. So what are the factors of COVID-19 that are impacting an individual's quality of sleep? The pandemic has brought up a lot of feelings of stress for people. This can be from the fear of contracting the virus, dealing with financial difficulties, and the constant feelings of uncertainty. With increased feelings of stress, people are experiencing mental health concerns and constant disruptions in their daily routines. People are experiencing changes in work schedules or having to teach online school at home, all while having to navigate the challenges of COVID. Due to changes in lockdown rules, being able to maintain these rules have also, has, has also been difficult. People are experiencing changes in their social factors with having less of an opportunity to see friends and family face to face and relying more on technology to help maintain these connections with others. Even with healthcare services, there are longer waits and having to adapt to virtual technology that contributes more to feelings of stress. This leads to an overall increase in screen time, which is a known factor that impacts quality of sleep. Overall, these are just some of the many ways COVID-19 and the pandemic are affecting sleep, especially for people with Parkinson's and their care partners. Before, before moving on to sharing some sleep strategies, we just want to quickly touch on and introduce what is occupational therapy, or OT for short. So occupational therapy enables meaningful occupational performance to enhance independence, safety, and quality of life. And it allows you to do what you want to do and what you need to do. OT helps performs you to do your activities as safely, as independently as possible, now you might be wondering, what are occupations? So occupations are not limited in the sense that you might think it is, whereas it's just that it's, it is something that you do for pay. Occupations are anything that occupies your time and they are activities that are meaningful to you and gives you purpose. So occupations varies individually and they are defined as central and essential to your identity. In OT, occupations can be divided into three domains self-care, productivity, and leisure. For self-care, it is related to your personal care. So it will be something like bathing, dressing, eating, your sleep, toileting, your functional mobility, maybe even taking care of your house, cleaning it, and even taking care of others. For productivity, this is where you think the, the paid work would come in. So for productivity, it, it could include both paid and non-paid work. It could even be volunteer work. And lastly, for leisure, it is, uh, it is your hobbies that you do, such as going out, socializing, or reading. And in OT, we like to take a holistic approach and provide individualized solutions. By holistic, I mean, what I mean by that is that they look at your specific occupations, uh, such as, for example, cooking. And what cooking, what the meaning does cooking gives to you and what makes it unique? And it also looks at your routine and your daily functions and provide individualized solutions. So not a one size fits all approach. 
And what does OT work with, with for people with Parkinson's? So it encompasses domains such as handwriting, typing, home modifications, providing adaptive uh, equipment, driving and your vision. And the occupation that we'll be focusing on in this webinar would be sleep. Yeah, and yes, sleep is an occupation. And OT does so by helps people with Parkinson's by providing strategies such as energy conservation, scheduling and time use and giving you reminders. And the strategies are mostly and usually non-medication focused. OT can also help you apply interventions from other health disciplines, such as from your doctor that prescribed you some medicine. So we can help in that by recommending blister packs at the set box to help you organize your medications, as well as help you implement cognitive strategies to ensure that you are taking your medications on time so that you remember them. Another example would be being prescribed exercises by maybe a physio, a phys physical therapist. If they give you some exercise, we can help you incorporate and implement that into your, in your, into your schedule, into your daily routine. We will be addressing sleep from an OT lens, so not from a biomedical approach, but we will be focusing on things and occupations and other related factors, such as your personal habits and the environments that you can change and adjust. We'll be focusing on non-medication interventions, so things that you can do to improve your sleep. Uh, with that said though, uh, many medications can affect your sleep, so you should review your medications that may affect your sleep with your doctor. And sleep hygiene. Sleep hygiene is critical to getting a good night's sleep. And sleep hygiene is a compilation of things that help you sleep better. There are many modifiable lifestyle choices that can improve your sleep. And one of the most important principles of sleep hygiene is having consistency and building habits um, that are behavioral in nature. So being consistent and following your a habit, a nighttime routine regularly. It can be a lot of simple things that you can do before, before night, before sleep. But altogether, these small things come together and their effects are greater than the sum of its parts to help influence your sleep. Now keep in mind that not all of the tips may apply to you. Some might benefit more for some people than for others. However, everyone's situation is different and unique, but there's, so, there's no harm in trying them out in your sleep routine and seeing what works best for you. And why is poor, having poor sleep such a huge problem? So poor sleep, both the quality as well as the quantity of sleep, can cause daytime sleepiness, fatigue, might even affect your concentration, your attention, it lessens your focus and your motivation. And poor sleep is really quite, is quite prevalent in, for people with Parkinson's. It's one of the most common non-motor symptoms. So about 50 to 64% of people experience some form of sleep issues. And from an OT perspective, we focus so much on occupations, right? And since sleep affects so much of our other occupations, if we have a bad night's sleep, it will impact everything we do the next day, which can impact our mood, our mental health, our cognition, your performance the next day. And then eventually it feeds into a negative cycle of getting good sleep the next night. And there are some factors that can affect your sleep, such as depression, anxiety, nighttime sweating, trouble moving in bed, and frequent urination during the night. Due to the impacts that motor as well as non-motor symptoms have on the lives of people living with Parkinson's, and now with the additional impact of COVID, this makes addressing sleep and sleep hygiene much more important than ever. In our profession in OT, we really like to use models in our practice to help explain to clients what we do. And one of, the, one of the models is the PO model, which is depicted on the slide here as a visual example. We like to use this model a lot because it is quite visually simple to explain. And the basis of the PO model is that we try to use various factors, such as the person, the environment, and the occupation as three different sec, fact, uh, sections that all together combine and influence how well you do, like, such as your occupational performance, um, which is how well you sleep. And the occupation we want to address, of course, here is sleep, which is represented by the area in the middle, uh, by the three circles, person, the environment, and the occupation. 
so that if there's a greater overlap in the middle, there will be a greater space and area, and then finally the best um, occupational performance, which is how well we sleep. And what, what I mean, previously I talked about briefly, I'm taking a holistic approach, and that means we're trying to analyze each factor, the person, the environment, and the occupation, and try to maximize each of them. So at the personal level, it is it pertains to anything that is unique to you, so such as your bodily structures and your functions, your lifestyle, your preferences, your personality, uh, even demographic factors, your age, your gender, and your race. And it can also be something mental, mental related, uh, such as cognition, your mental health, and your emotions. Now, more specifically related to people with Parkinson's, it could be your fatigue or your energy levels, or any motor symptoms you might be experiencing when you're sleeping, such as tremors, restlessness, pain, uh, anxiety, or social withdrawal. And for the environment, uh, broadly speaking in OTA, we refer them to physical, cultural, economic, and social environments. But for the purpose of addressing sleep in this webinar, it will be related to the environment in your bedroom or your bed, such as how soft or firm your bed is, whether it is at the correct height, your bed sheets, as well as assistive devices such as bed rails. And lastly, for occupation. Occupation are pretty much just any activities that you do, including the activity demands as well as the requirements. The, this webinar will be focusing on sleep itself as an occupation and also other occupations that you can do to help with sleep. And lastly, just to emphasize the PMO model, um, this is a visual to help you understand what is meant by having a better occupational performance, which is having better sleep. So on the left, you can see that there's a more of an overlap between the person, the environment, and the occupations with the circles. As such, there's a greater area in the middle. So there's a better occupational performance as an outcome. So the, the, the picture on the left, the circles, might suggest better sleep. Now, the situation on the right side is that there's less overlap. So your, it, this might suggest that the, uh, the person might be having some sleep disturbances. And the three elements, they, they are dynamic and they affect each other. And all together, they combine and affect our occupational performance, which in this session is sleep, how well you sleep. And now for the rest of this webinar, we'll be focusing our, and basing our strategies on each of the three domains and how you can maximize each of them. So the first area we will address is person level interventions. So these person level interventions are grouped into three categories, creating a sleep and wake up routine, lifestyle changes and stress management. It is important to acknowledge that these suggestions, although some specific to certain sleep conditions or symptoms associated with Parkinson's, can also be useful for care partners of those with Parkinson's as well. So creating a sleep and wake up routine can be helpful to improve sleep. Here are some suggestions on how to create an effective sleep and wake up routine. So first off, you wanna create a sleep schedule. So go to bed and wake up at the same time each day to maintain a consistent routine so your body gets used to this. You also want to avoid intense TV shows, video games, or other activities that cause emotional reactions that could cause you to feel stressed or overwhelmed before bed. This is particularly relevant right now with the pandemic as there's a lot of media coverage and news about it. So it's important you limit this before bed and try to limit it throughout the day as well, as best you can. And this is gonna help with feelings of stress or anxiety. So if you experience the need to use the washroom frequently throughout the night, go to the bathroom right before you go to bed. This can even be helpful for those that don't wake up frequently to prevent this from happening. Another suggestion is to create a relaxing routine prior to bedtime. And so this is gonna look different for everyone based on your preferences. So some suggestions to include in this routine could be gentle stretching or yoga, playing a relaxation soundtrack or calming music, or doing meditation or deep breathing exercises to calm your body and mind before bed. And I will touch on this in a few slides. So in addition, it can also be helpful to create a morning routine after waking up that your body associates with getting up. This is again gonna be very individualized for each person, 
um, what your morning routine is going to look like as each individual has different schedules and obligations to attend to. So there are many lifestyle changes you can make that can help improve your sleep hygiene and help you get a better night's sleep. So it's recommended that you avoid stimulants, so this includes caffeine or nicotine, after latest 4 p.m. As stimulants can make you feel more awake and can make it harder to fall asleep, fall asleep and stay asleep. It is also best to avoid alcohol consumption close to bed, bedtime, so that's gonna be within four to six hours. So although alcohol may make you feel tired and fall asleep, it does impact your ability to stay asleep. And this can lead to a broken up and disruptive sleep causing you to wake up throughout the night. In addition, it can also cause the urge to urinate throughout the night, which can also create further problems for those that already experience nocturia, which is frequent urination. So it is important for these reasons that you not use alcohol as a sleep aid. It is also suggested to limit your fluid intake in the evenings close to bedtime, so preferably after 6 p.m., to help prevent the urge to urinate frequently in the evening. It is also best to avoid heavy or starchy foods before bed when possible. You also wanna get as much exposure to bright light during the day as possible and avoid this exposure in the evening. So by doing this, it helps your body to be able to maintain its natural sleep-wake cycle, which is strongly correlated to light exposure. So exercising during the day can also help you sleep better at night, but it's important not to do strenuous exercise too close to bedtime. So according to the experts, they recommend avoiding this two to four hours before going to bed to allow your body time to lower its adrenaline levels, body temperature, and heart rate to get prepared for sleep. So in fact, it's also been suggested from a study done with Parkinson's patients and the effect of COVID on sleep that exercising over an hour a day could actually act as a protective factor for sleep concerns and improve one's sleep. So sleep can also be affected by concerns with anxiety or stress, which as discussed earlier, can also be worsened due to the current situation with COVID-19. So some stress management techniques can help you unwind for the day or help reduce your stress or anxiety levels, which can have a positive impact on your sleep. So some techniques that you can use include journaling or writing down your thoughts about the day or how you are feeling. So this allows you to put your thoughts down on paper so your mind can try to let go of any worries or strong emotions to enable you to relax before bed and get to sleep easier. You could also consider gratitude journaling, which is writing down things you are grateful for. This can help you go to bed in a more positive mindset. Practicing mindfulness techniques can be a great way to relax before bed and reduce stress levels, which can improve your sleep quality. So one mindfulness technique you can practice is square breathing. And this is a technique that encourages slow breathing. So it's done by a pattern of inhaling for a count of four, then holding this for a count of four, then exhaling for a count of four, and then keeping your lungs empty for a count of four. You can also do guided visual imagery, which invokes visualizing pleasant or calming environments in order to invoke a relaxed body state. You could also use progressive muscle relaxation, which involves releasing tension by relaxing muscles through the tightening and relaxation of the muscle groups one by one. So I did attach links on the screen that demonstrate each of these techniques that you can watch on your own time. And you can also look at other videos as well that demonstrate these techniques if you want further clarification on these at all. Um, and there is a lot of options for guided visual imagery as well. So the one I selected was for a nature walk, but you can find videos um, of this for the places you find peaceful or you can lead your own guided imagery. And you can also check for some apps on your smart devices, which will be touched on a little bit later in the presentation, as well as some other YouTube videos online that are gonna show some guided mindfulness techniques. And there's also classes or groups that teach these techniques as well. So cognitive behavioral therapy has also been suggested to help deal with anxiety and depression that individuals may be experiencing that may be impacting sleep quality. So cognitive behavioral therapy is a type of psychotherapy that helps you become more aware of your thinking to be able to help reduce negative thinking and behavior patterns. It is used with individuals that may have anxiety or depression, as well as those with sleep concerns and has been proven effective in helping with insomnia.
So the next area that we will address for improving sleep hygiene is interventions for your environment. So this can be done by analyzing your bedroom and modifying light, temperature, and noise, or also by adding assistive equipment to contribute to a better night's sleep. So to begin, we're gonna look at lighting. So lighting is actually a large impact to your sleep hygiene as it interferes and initiates our circadian rhythms or what we like to call our natural sleep-wake cycles. To help promote sleep hygiene, the type of light being used in your bedroom and bathroom should be evaluated. So white and blue light are known to have the most impact in disturbing the sleep-wake cycle. White light is what we use throughout the day and is known to improve mood and alertness and blue light is what is associated with the technology we use every day. So the main goal here is to reduce the exposure of white and blue light throughout your bedtime routine in order to reduce any disruptions to your circadian rhythms. This can be done with using curtains, blinds, or eye masks and developing a no screen bedtime routine. If you do need to use your electronics before bed, try limiting your use to one hour before bed and switch your device into night shift mode, or try using blue light filters to reduce the amount of blue light interfering with this sleep-wake cycle. Next, with Parkinson's, getting up to use the washroom throughout the night is a common occurrence. Paired with concerns with tripping and falling, you want to ensure you have a clear bath pathway from your bed to your bathroom. You can try adding night lights along the path using an orange slash yellow or red light, as these options do not disrupt your sleep or your sleep of your partner sharing the room. Adding night lights can also help reduce the occurrence of freezing of gait and possible falls, as darkened areas and shadows may aggravate the occurrence of freezing. You can also try adding motion sensor night lights in the bathroom to help brighten a safe path. There is also a product that allows you the option to light up your toilet. If frequent nightly bathroom trips are impacting your ability to get back to sleep, you can try pur purchasing the motion sensor toilet light and setting the function to red light to help illuminate the bathroom without disturbing your sleep cycles. Red light is known to cause the least amount of disruption to your sleep-wake cycle. So next we're gonna look at noise and temperature. So the amount of noise and temperature in your bedroom can also be a factor impacting your quality of sleep you get every night. Try and reduce the noise within your bedroom while completing your sleep routine or while trying to fall asleep. This can be done by wearing earplugs or using white noise machines. There's even some technology that has headphones or earbud options for controlled timing of white noise and alarm clocks that you can wear while sleeping and not disrupt your partner sharing the bed. This example is called Bose Sleep Buds. However, this option does tend to be quite expensive so it's recommended that you trial white noise first to see if it helps improve your sleep. This can be done by using um, white noise machines or YouTube videos to see if white noise actually does help you fall asleep before you invest in this expensive alternative. For temperature, the optimal sleep condition for a bedroom is between 18 to 20 degrees Celsius. Temperature can be controlled in a room by adding a fan or humidifier and this also doubles as a type of white noise to add to the environment. You can try changing out your blankets to fit your temperature needs, or try using sheets and blankets that help with temperature regulation. So next we're gonna look at bedroom modification. So in regards to your bedroom uh, environment, modifications can happen by adding adaptive equipment or changing the equipment being used to best fit your current needs. Reaching out to an occupational therapist about adaptive equipment can help improve transferring in and bed and help reduce risk of falls at night. A common suggestion an occupational therapist may propose is adding a bed rail. This can help with transferring in and out of bed and also with turning in bed. There are options that involve easy installation where you only have to slip the device under your mattress and the bar is gonna be right beside you. However, ensure that the rail is at shoulder level for the user to allow for comfortable grip while in use. To measure this, lie down in your bed with your head on your pillow and ensure that bed rail is positioned such that it's in line with your shoulder. Another option, more permanent in nature, would be installing a bed pole attached from floor to ceiling 
and having that placed right beside your bed for easy access. For an individual experiencing concerns with getting out to go to the bathroom a lot in the evening, try um, and you are having a fear of falling, an occupational therapist may also suggest the option of adding a commode or a spill-proof bedside urinal to your bedroom to reduce the need for that travel and minimize that risk of falling in the dark. Other non-adaptive equipment changes to the bedroom can be sleeping on a firmer mattress, which can also help with transferring in and out of bed. You can also try wearing silk pajamas or having silk sheets on your bed to help you move around. However, please only choose one option so that you're not ensuring that you're slipping out of bed. An alarm clock is in the bedroom, especially right beside you while you're sleeping, can be stressful for individuals experiencing insomnia or difficulties falling asleep. Uh, to reduce these stress levels, try removing your alarm clock out of your room or even turning the face of the alarm clock away from you to help reduce some of those stress levels and help you fall asleep. Finally, as mentioned previously, a common sleep disorder for people with Parkinson's is REM sleep behavior disorder or RBD that results in people acting out their dreams and nightmares. Individuals may consider having separate beds or sleeping in separate rooms if safety for others becomes a concern. Last but not least, we have occupation interventions. So we'll be in this last session, section, we'll be addressing sleep as an occupation and what you can do with your sleep. So one of the ways you can do to improve your sleep is uh, called sleep tracking, which is provide you with ways to track your progress, your sleep, as well as identify sleep patterns. It may help to keep a progress lock to identify sleep patterns because um, identifying patterns such as poor sleep, and then it can give you a record of how you did. So it could be things such as how many times do you wake up because of what? Maybe because you have to go to the washroom, maybe the temperature is too hot, too cold. And then also maybe uh, measuring, recording what you do to get back to sleep and how long did it take you to get back to sleep. So the sleep tracking, it serves as a useful tool because it is much, much more helpful to have a record to bring to your doctor or an occupational therapist rather than just going to them and telling them that you're having poor sleep. By having a, a long-term record, it gives the health professional much more to work with because they know much more about the details of why you're experiencing poor sleep and see the patterns. So there's a two ways you can do to uh, track your sleep, the traditional, the digital way. So for the traditional way, it's done with a pen and paper, with a sleep lock or with journaling. And for this method, it relies on you having to kind of relies on your memory and take up takes up time after you wake up the next day to record it. And for the digital way, we should be done with devices such as an Apple Watch, a Fitbit, or other sleep devices. Now, the concern for this one, or the like, a consideration is is that uh, that it may for the digital way, it may or may not be as accurate as you think it might be. But the benefit of this is that it's done automatically and it doesn't take up extra time for you, and you don't have to rely on your memory to remember how well you slept. And there are also some sleep apps that you can try out. Um, so one of them is called Pizzas, so P-Z-I-Z-Z, -Z, and it's an, it's an app to help you quiet your mind, in turn helping you fall as well as stay asleep, and it does so by providing you with some sort of uh, audio, such as music, voiceovers as well as sound effects. Now the app is, is backed by clinical research and data, and it, it has been found to be particularly useful for people with insomnia. And it works by calming your mind so that your mind are not constantly wandering off and thinking about different things while you're laying in bed trying to fall asleep. Another app is called Sleep Cycle. As the name suggests, um, since as we're sleeping each night, we go through different sleep cycles. And this app monitors our sleep patterns and try to wake us up in the lightest sleep phase as possible so that we can wake up feeling more refreshed. Some general tips for sleeping includes 
reserving the bed only for sleep or intimacy, and avoiding things such as shift work, as it can really mess up your sleep routines, as well as other occupations that occur at unnatural times, such as staying up too late to watch movies. Now, the last tip is to try and limit naps. And the, the general recommendation is to limit naps to no more than 20 to 30 minutes at a time during the day. But we, had, we acknowledge that this is not always possible and is actually quite individualized. As some people, they do need those naps to get through the day. However, in general, uh, it's best to avoid naps, especially in the late afternoon or the early evening. Another useful rule or like strategy is called the 15 minute rule. And what it is is that once you lay, you have laid down in bed for about 15 minutes and you can't fall asleep, then once that happens, you should try to get out of bed and go to another room and do another relaxing activity, such as listening to music, reading a book or a magazine in low light, or listening to audiobooks or podcasts. You should continue doing this until you, fall, you feel sleepy and then you should try to return to the bedroom and then you try to go back to sleep. Now the reasoning behind this is that if you can't fall asleep in bed, you get anxious because you're trying really hard to fall asleep. And then over time, the brain slowly associates the bed as a place of suffering and discomfort because you can't fall asleep as you're, trying, you're, laying, you're lying down in the bed awake. And it contributes to a negative cycle for future sleep because your brain kind of remembers that uh, the bed is a place that you can't fall asleep. So why are we suggesting that you get, get out of bed and go to another room? Because it reduces the amount of time that you're spending in bed while you're awake. And it just helps to train your brain to associate um, the bed with only sleeping and sleeping only. It seems counterintuitive. But if you actively try to think about wanting to fall asleep, the harder you think about it, the harder it is to actually fall asleep. And in order to sleep, you have to not think about sleep. Now, the 15 minute rule can also be implemented if you wake up in the middle of the night and can't fall back to sleep again. Just a word of caution, there might be some fall risk of getting in and out of the bed, especially at night when it's dark. So just make sure that you're following the environmental strategies mentioned in the previous section, such as ensuring that there's a clear pathway to the to the to another room, or making sure that you have adequate lighting. There are also other occupations to help you fall asleep better, and one of them is meditation. And meditation is the practice of training awareness or, or attention through different activities, such as deep breathing, relaxation exercises, progressive muscle relaxation, or mindfulness. And the goal is to feel conscious about what you are thinking about and your state of being in the present. For meditation to get started, there are lots of resources out there available. There are some apps that you can try out that are quite effective to help you get started. So some of the more well-known ones include Calm and Headspace. And once you're more comfortable with meditation, you can also establish your own routine. Uh, yoga is also quite effective, particularly for alleviating restless leg syndrome symptoms. It can help you sleep better and relaxes your mind and lowers your stress. You can also combine yoga with other stretching exercises. But just to remember not to do uh, exercises that are too physically demanding, um, that are too close, that are close to your bedtime. So for yoga to get started, there are some virtual classes available that are being offered in your area. You can also even go to your local library, and they have oftentimes they have lots of great resources that are free, books or DVDs in the library that you can borrow and try out. And lastly, there are also two. Um, uh, occupations to help you fall asleep, but those require some sort of help uh, or assistance from a healthcare professional. The first one is called biofeedback and it's offered by clinical psychologists. So the principle for biofeedback is that you're trying to listen to your body and your mind. So maybe listening to how you're breathing and feeling your muscles relaxing and contracting 
and to overall develop a greater awareness of the body to control and alleviate stress, which may help you fall asleep. And light therapy. And light therapy is an involved sessions that include an exposure to an artificial light source for a set amount of time to help address sleep specific disorders, such as insomnia, depression, or jet lag. Now for this light therapy, you need a recommendation by a doctor to get started. And the goal is to reset or adjust your circadian rhythm, which is also known as the body's internal clock that regulates when you should feel tired or alert during the day. So additional to the interventions and suggestions we have provided here today, we have also listed various community resources within Southwestern Ontario. These various clinics and labs will be able to provide further sleep problems or diagnosis, disorder diagnoses, pharmacological or non-pharmacological interventions, all by sleep experts. This includes medication that may assist in combination with sleep hygiene strategies, cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia, or light therapy to name a few. So what are the benefits for improved sleep hygiene, especially with Parkinson's disease? Many individuals with living with Parkinson's experience a phenomenon called sleep benefit when they wake up in the morning after a good night's sleep. Sleep benefit is defined as an experience of a temporary decrease in Parkinson's symptoms upon awakening after a period of sleep. This usually occurs before medication and where the, and the patient ex, um, explains that they're feeling as if they're in an on state or even better. Individuals experiencing sleep benefit report having sometimes a reduction in tremors and a reduced instance of freezing a gait in the morning. This sleep benefit phenomenon is reported to last from 30 minutes to two hours for certain individuals. Although some Parkinson's symptoms are reduced for this time frame. People do still report that their feelings of stiffness, especially with their mobility, still occur in the morning. More benefits for improved sleep hygiene are feeling well rested and experiencing an improved, move, improved mood overall. With more sleep, people experience more energy that corresponds to an improved functioning throughout the day and being able to participate and perform more meaningful activities. We decided that we want to thank everyone for coming and leaving you by leaving you some resources to keep after the webinar. And this includes a checklist and a sleep diary. So why, is, why do we need a checklist? We need a checklist because a lot of the sleep hygiene strategies, the things that we mentioned, a lot of them might seem like common sense or trivial. You might think that you know them or you're already doing some of them, but you might be actually missing out on some of the other ones that, uh, that could end, end up being the ones that actually works for you. So having that checklist, making sure you're checking off everything, make sure that you are doing everything you can to maximize your sleep. The checklist is also based on the webinar we presented today. So you can also act as a summary of what you have learned today. For the sleep log, it records your sleep patterns, including how many times you wake up, how many naps you took, as well as other lifestyle patterns that may be affecting your sleep. And it's just the purpose is to identify patterns of poor sleep, which may be useful in seeing a pattern over time. And then it could also be used in the future to bring up with your healthcare team, such as your doctor. And we'll be sending them out to everyone that registered in the follow-up email so that you can keep. So to conclude this webinar, we wanted to summarize quickly some key points from the presentation. So occupational therapy is about helping individuals to engage in their meaningful activities by enhancing independence, safety, and quality of life through various holistic and client-centered interventions. We also learned that sleep hygiene is a collection of things that can help a person sleep. We learned about some person-level interventions, which include creating a sleep and wake-up routine, lifestyle changes, and stress management strategies. We also learned about environment interventions, which included addressing lighting, noise, and temperature, and making modifications to the bedroom. Then we also talked about occupation interventions, also known as sleep interventions. So some of these included the use of sleep tracking or sleep apps, limiting naps, 
and the 15 minute rule. We also learned about some benefits of improved sleep hygiene, which include reduction in Parkinson's symptoms, improved mood and energy, as well as an improved quality of life. So we wanted to thank you for attending and listening to our webinar, and we hope you've learned some valuable strategies and tips that can improve your sleep. If you have any questions or are interested in a session with an occupational therapy student, you can contact us. We are with the organization until June 25th, and we just put our emails below for you. Great, thank you so much. Um, that was a that was a really fantastic presentation, and um, sorry, just get to the right screen here. Thank you for doing it. You know, Parkinson Society Southwestern Ontario is so fortunate to have a partnership with Western University uh, that allows us to have fantastic students uh, such as 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 Kelly, Sydney, and Jonathan do their time with us or spend their clinical time with us and. I encourage everybody to um, contact them with questions, use the, the, their knowledge and uh, let it benefit yourself. We do have some questions, so we'll get to those. Uh, so we're not running out of time. The first question is, is how can you use the, the sleep strategies without disturbing your partner? Uh, I'll, I'll take that one. So that's, that's a great question. Um, so for me, I think the best way to integrate those sleep hygiene strategies into your nighttime routine without disturbing your partner is to is honestly just to have your partner be part of the, the discussion, to participate in these sleep hygiene, hygiene strategies as well. It can help keep them, you can also keep, keep the person accountable since you're doing it together. So just having a discussion with your partner, whether they're comfortable about these topics, and an and environmental uh, strategy you can try out is using a, using red lights instead of bright white ones, as red lights are less likely to interact with sleep cycles and is potentially less disturbing to your partner. And I would think that there's also a possible discussion uh, of separating sleeping arrangements or perhaps even in a different room, so you can minimize sleep dis sleep disruptions. Okay, great, thank you. Um, second question, do you have any ideas on how to deal with pain while sleeping? So with pain, it's gonna be very individualized depending on um, what type of pain people are experiencing, but some strategies um, I personally came across through my research was using a heating pad on areas that you find pretty painful. Um, keep turning it off before you go to sleep. Um, um, and then also using a different type of body pillow. And this will help you lay in certain positions to make you feel more comfortable, but reaching out to your doctor and figuring out what positions are best for you. And if there's additional medication is also a great option. Okay, great. This is, this is a great question. I love it. Sorry, because this is my life in a nutshell. Is there any, any information on the effects of pets sharing your bed and how they affect your sleep patterns. Um, I don't have an answer right off the bat, but I think that um, based on like the environment, pets tend to be kind of noisy. So if your pet doesn't settle in very well, that might not be a great option to have them in your room, especially if you're having difficulties falling asleep. However, if they find they also provide a lot of comfort for people so if they're quiet and you find that you aren't really as disturbed as much with them absolutely go for it but if you find they are a little bit disturbing you might have to look at not having them in the bed with you or maybe also removing them from the room when you're sleeping as well okay great answer um the other question was um should we avoid watching upsetting news before bed yeah, I can discuss that one. Um, so it is best to try to avoid watching news that might be upsetting or that could cause an emotional reaction close to bed. 
Um, just because you'd go to bed kind of with your mind on that, you might not be in the best mindset and feeling kind of stressed. And as we know, stress can really impact sleep. So I would recommend against that if possible. Excellent. Okay, well, I would like to thank everyone for attending today and, and our three presenters. Uh, again, Parkinson's Society Southwestern Ontario is so fortunate to have these three, these three master's students with us. Please feel free to contact us and use their, their resources and their talents um, to help you feel better and help you sleep better. I have a couple public service announcements just before we sign off for the day. Um, first of all, Coffee Clatch will be continuing throughout the summer months and we invite everyone who enjoys our support groups and um, won't be able to attend support groups or, or having their support groups not go through the summer to join us on Coffee Clatch which happens every Monday morning from 10 a.m. to 11 a.m. and you just need to contact the PSSO website uh, for the link to join us and all are welcome. It's a great way of sharing information, sharing resources and uh, having a few laughs and jokes along the way as well. Info about this year's Parkinson, Walk for Parkinson's is now available also on the new website at www.psso.ca. Uh, Walk It this year will be on September 12th and 11th, or 11th and 12th, sorry. Um, and we're encouraging everybody, this is our largest fundraiser of the year. It's what helps us continue our programs uh, if you can't participate by joining us uh, on the walk, you can participate virtually, you can get pledges, you can make pledges, and every little bit support of support goes to help maintain our programs, our support groups, and uh, everything that, that we do to help you as a Parkinson's patient. We're also very, very happy to announce that the fall conference has been confirmed for Saturday, October 16th. It will be available as an in-person event and also a virtual event. So it's kind of a hybrid model this year. More information will be coming out on it. And uh, we have Dr. We have Dr. Uh, Alfonso Fazzano, uh, Dr. Mander Jog, and Angela Roberts as our three keynote speakers. So it's going to be a really exciting day. We, ant we anticipate a lot of people will be joining us. Um, watch your, your e-news for more information about the fall conference and finally on behalf of all of us at Parkinson's Society Southwestern Ontario we want to wish you a safe and very healthy summer coming up please take the, the time to recharge get your COVID shot um, be healthy and be safe and we look forward to you joining us again for more webinars starting in October and also our support groups joining us uh, starting again in September. So on behalf of all of us, again, thank you to Jonathan, Kelly, and Sydney. Have a safe and healthy summer. And don't forget, keep checking back with us at pssoca Thank you, everyone.